before I start the formal part of this evening, I would first like to express my gratitude that the Cambridge Society Alumni Association chose the Museum Society and CSMVS to partner in this evening's program with us. So I'd first like to invite Dr. Manjari Kamath. She is the director in charge of programming at the Cambridge Society. So over to you, Manjri. Please introduce our audience to the society. Technical team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Cambridge Society Bombay, I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Mustansir Dalvi, who is our speaker for today. And it's an absolute pleasure to host this program in collaboration with Dr. Firoza Godrej and the Museum Society of Mumbai and the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangradai. I would like to introduce the audience briefly to the Cambridge Society Bombay. The Cambridge Society is an alumni group comprising of ex-students of the University of Cambridge who live in Mumbai or have lived in Mumbai. The society was founded in 1948. It currently has 145 members and the society's president is Mr. Tanil Kilachand. It is managed by a general committee. The group also runs the Cambridge Society Bombay Scholarship Fund. Apart from this, the society organizes a number of events and lectures through the year and keeps in touch with intellectuals from different fields ranging from the arts and science to culture. The society also holds a function once a year where it hosts the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. We would in future very much look forward to more such collaborative events and to have more audience from various fields for our lectures and events. Over to you, Jason. Thank you, Manjri. It was interesting to note that it's such an old society and that you have so many members, yes. alumni who reside in Bombay or who have resided in Bombay. Yes. So now let me add my own welcome to Dr. Mustansir Dalvi, an old friend who I've been wanting to have at this event for many, many months. He's very busy with his teaching schedule so Mustansir, I greatly appreciate that you have taken time out to prepare a lecture, which I know which is very, very dear to your heart and which all of us are eagerly waiting to hear. So on behalf of the chairman and the trustees of the CSMBS, the director general, Mr. Sabya Sachi Mukherjee, on behalf of our co-hosts this evening, the Cambridge Society, Mr. Tanil Kilachan, Ms. Dr. Manjri Kamath, Mr. Jai Munim, Dr. Harshal Mathur, on behalf of the Museum Society of Bombay and my own executive committee, a very, very warm welcome to you, Mustan Sir. And I hope Smita has also joined us to hear you speak. So welcome, uh, Smita. Uh, if you're here, we are very delighted that you're with us. It's always exciting to host a lecture by Mustansir. You never know what you're going to hear and what you're going to see. He has quite an array of slides to present to us this evening. And when, he, when we discuss the topic, Art Deco Architecture in India, not just Bombay, I was really pleased because as we go around our city and beyond the MMRDA region and indeed around our country, we notice these buildings which look very familiar, which have the same footprint of what we see in Mumbai and in other parts of the world. So thank you, Mustansir. We're going to have look at this through a different lens. A few words about our distinguished speaker this evening. He's a professor, of course, of architecture at the Sir JJ College of Architecture. He has a postgraduate qualification in architecture and Indian aesthetics from the University of Mumbai. He received the PhD degree from none other than the Indian Institute of Technology 
IIT Bombay in 2017. The title of his doctoral research is Buildings as a Text, Developing a Semiotic of Bombay's Art Deco Architecture from 1930 to 1949. He's a member of the Academic Council and Chair of the Board of Studies in Architectural Education of the University of Mumbai. And he's also on the board of the governors of MMRDA Heritage Conservation Society. And I'm glad we have him there as our friend and a trustee at the NGMO, NGO Art Deco Mumbai. Dr. Dalvi has lectured, read, and published several papers on architectural education, architectural history, and of course, heritage, urban transformation, and architectural semiotics. He is the editor of the 20th Century Compul Compulsions, a publishing, publication by Marg, which is a collection of writings about early Indian modernist architecture from some of the most important practitioners of the time. His latest book is The Past is Present, Pedagogical Practices in Architecture at the Bombay School of Art. This is with Sir JJ and UDRI. He is a columnist for various online and print news outlets where he critically observes Mumbai's urbanity and charts the semiotics of its contradictions. He's particularly interested in the development of Bombay's architecture or Mumbai's architecture during its emergence as a vibrant metropolis. So what are we going to see today? I'm going to read something to you because I really would like you all to have some questions ready, either in the chat box or later on when we open up online for discussion. Bombay has conventionally been associated with Art Deco architecture always compared to and competing with who else but cities like Miami. While the city certainly displays a large collection of buildings identified in this style, this lecture expands the appreciation of Art Deco in India by demonstrating its ubiquity all over the country. To appreciate Art Deco, one must look to contemporary developments in the 1930s, 40s in terms of mobility, livelihood, aspirations, popular culture, and aesthetic choices. The paradigmatic change in building technology, especially the rising use of reinforced cement concrete, RCC, which transformed buildings all over India, leading to the easy assimilation of its style. In this lecture, we will look at its early adoption as a kind of what Mustan Seer calls high Indian Art Deco, very apt by some princely states and then move to the more quotidian expressions of this architecture by the Indian middle classes who really e embrace this type of architecture. It was very, very modern and accessible to everyone. We will also further our gaze beyond our shores to see similar kinds of building designs becoming popular in cities dotting the edge of the Indian Ocean all along our coastline. Before full-blown modernism, that would be seen in India post-independence, Art Deco in India was truly the avant-garde for the architecture of a modern and cosmopolitan Indian state, which we were emerging after 1947. No more from me. Mustansi, thank you so much. Really looking forward to your slides and your presentation this evening. And before I hand you over to the technical team, Tech team, thank you so much once again, ably led by Jason Johns, our very own honorary secretary, Aishwarya, Renalini, and Yashraj. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Sit back, it's going to be an armchair journey of delights. Thank you. Thank you, Feroza. Uh, good evening. I am very pleased to deliver this lecture today. Uh, honoring an invitation from the Museum Society of Mumbai, uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrahale, and uh, the Cambridge Society Bombay. Uh, my thanks to Dr. Firoza Godrej, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, and Dr. Manjari Kamath for their support and encouragement. Uh, and uh, really, 
that is what uh, made me you know enjoy the process of putting this lecture together uh, thank you to uh, jason and the technical team as well uh, of course let me in advance thank everyone who is present here and i see so many names and so many friends both i hope you will find this discussion on the spread of art deco uh, architecture interesting uh, like uh, dr godrej mentioned you know one does tend to associate art deco architecture with bombay primarily when it comes to looking at a country such as ours and uh, I suppose one of the ways in which uh, we can disabuse that notion is simply by showing you an array of examples from places uh, other than Bombay, uh, where we find architecture like this uh, also. Uh, what I intend to do is essentially to take you through uh, some of what makes Art Deco Art Deco. And therefore it becomes relatively easy to kind of you know spot buildings like these, uh, especially when they when when you encounter them in the most unexpected of places. And I can assure you that that is what I have done, seen Art Deco where you really don't expect something like that. Uh, what does that all amount to is something we will go forward uh, in this lecture. Uh, now, you know, the <clears throat> uh, what Art Deco is and where it comes from and how to recognize it and all that is, uh, of course, uh, something for other uh, lectures. But what I uh, intend to do is to start with this notion that uh, when Art Deco actually started, uh, or when this kind of form of building started to be recognized, uh, by and large, it was seen as uh, something very upmarket. Uh, it was uh, embraced in uh, simultaneity with the rise of the of 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 the skyscrapers say for example in manhattan uh, it was embraced in simultaneity uh, with the rise of a certain kind of mobility which was essentially transoceanic uh, uh, across the atlantic uh, joining say europe to the united states and in this period what we popularly know as the jazz age the period between uh, the two wars, uh, you had this uh, style emerging as a kind of high art deco. And we will begin with that so that we get an idea for that. Uh, and then, of course, it actually just explodes into a kind of everyday art deco that uh, we see all around us and that we are so familiar with. Now the notion of high art deco kind of uh, probably differs from place to place, uh, but in India, we have this very unique uh, uh, location of a high art deco because by and large, uh, it is associated with uh, the princes, the princely states, which were such an important part of colonial India, uh, especially in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, so we will look at that and then we will try and see how uh, Art Deco is assimilated in such a wide uh, spread uh, that it is uh, you know, impossible to differentiate from uh, our urban uh, you know, the, the form of our urban cities in so much as in many of our urban cities, the form has been the derivation of the location of various uh, Art Deco uh, buildings. So uh, with your permission, I would like to share my screen now. So uh, the early adoption, like I said, of Art Deco, both in, the, in places associated with Art Deco, like the United States, as well as in uh, India, was through this uh, very exclusive kind of uh, 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 place. Uh, in, in the case of uh, the United States, Art Deco was readily assimilated and appropriated by the corporates, uh, people in industry. And let's begin with that. 
uh, with probably the most iconic building ever, I think, to be associated with Art Deco architecture, which is the Chrysler Building in uh, New York. Uh, and this building was the tallest building uh, in the world, very interestingly, just for the space of 11 months uh, between May 1930 and uh, 1931, when it was surpassed by the Empire State Building. But this building epitomizes so many ideas of high art deco. Uh, it is a steel frame building with masonry infill. There are several areas in which you have decorative stainless steel. You can see the sunbursts uh, at the top of the building, at the pinnacle. Uh, it has uh, almost like a neo-Gothic building gargoyles uh, on the 31st floor. Uh, it has replicas of hubcaps of the Chrysler car. And on the 60th floor, uh, 61st floor, as you can see in this image, it has gargoyle, but in the shape of the American Eagle, which is the national bird, all told a very showy, a very spectacular uh, kind of building. And probably the exterior of the building is uh, maybe, you know, put a little bit in the shade if one just enters the building and sees the amazing lobby of the, of the building in which uh, one, one tends to see the richest of materials which are quite costly imported to America. There is red African granite, there is travertine from Siena. Uh, the light fixtures are covered with Belgian blue marble and Mexican onyx uh, and so on. You know, even the, uh, the elevators, which you can see in the lower image, each of the elevator doors is designed as a mural, a work of art, each one uh, being different. Uh, this is also the place where there is a large mural called Transport and Human Endeavor. And it was commissioned by Edward Tumble in uh, 1930. And the theme of the mural is energy and man's application of it to the solution of his problems. Uh, what that mural does, it pays homage, it celebrates the golden age of aviation. Uh, it wasn't uh, too many decades ago at this point when the Wright brothers probably first uh, took their first flight. And that, in one sense, is uh, symbolic of the machine age. So here is the point. When we look at Art Deco architecture, we are, in a sense, there are several allusions. And the allusions which we should look at is the notion of you know, springing, high-rise tall structures, rich ornaments, showpiece murals, uh, the expression of mobility, and we will talk a little bit more about that later, uh, and human endeavor. Like I said, this building was surpassed very quickly by this one, a 102 story Art Deco skyscraper uh, designed by Shreve Lam and Harman. Uh, and this building, of course, uh, for many, many years, I think the world until uh, Yamasaki's World Trade Center was the tallest building in the world and uh, in America. Uh, we talked about mobility and here is a direct correlation with mobility because at the very top of this uh, skyscraper you have an antenna and that was an antenna meant to tether airships which were a very popular mode of transport, uh, transoceanic mode of transport until of course the uh, infamous uh, Hindenburg uh, disaster uh, where people could go across uh, the ocean in this very large balloon. Uh, so the airships, when they would come here, would get tethered to the antenna uh, on the Empire State Building. Perhaps one reason why it has a shape like this. You will also notice that the Empire State Building has this very characteristic, a very definitive step shape. And that step shape is popularly called a ziggurat kind of shape. Now, why that is the case is something that we will 
uh, see by and by. But just like the Chrysler building, the lobby of the Empire State Building too was an absolute showpiece in which you can see several ideas that would become fairly common with uh, Art Deco architecture, including the step profile of the building, the sunburst, uh, the use of these very costly materials for decoration, the striations, the stripes, uh, you know, banding, uh, and so on. Uh, these ideas would become common, these ideas would become popular, and these ideas would come down, you know, into the more quotidian forms of Art Deco expression, even when uh, people stopped using, uh, you know, very costly materials such as these. So, like I mentioned earlier, Art Deco was very soon adopted by corporates, big industry. It was even adopted by the government, especially in the uh, making of, uh, uh, of, of infrastructure, uh, transportation terminals like this one in Ohio. Uh, and of course, it was adopted by the luxury and entertainment segment, which was all about the fulfillment of aspirations. And perhaps no other uh, example is better when it comes to this than the, uh, the design and the, 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 the life of this ocean liner called the SS Normandy. Uh, this ocean liner uh, <clears throat> took people across the uh, Atlantic. Uh, it, it joined the United States with Europe and the rich and the famous uh, spent their time in this. And it, you know, very typically it is also not only a place to look at the rich and famous, but it's also a place where the rich and famous can be looked at, uh, so to speak. And that would normally happen in interiors such as this. Uh, this is the design of, uh, of, of the interior dining space inside the Normandy, apparently a room that was longer than the, you know, the Hall of Galleries, uh, uh, the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles. Uh, now, here we are seeing this very interesting coming together of uh, art deco and the notion of movement, transport, and mobility. Uh, Michael Windover, who has written this very wonderful book called Art Deco, A Mode of Mobility, uh, you know, looks at art deco as the high end as well as the, uh, the low cost uh, commodification through the clever negotiation of contesting identities, both national and individual, through its visual normalization of aristocratic and archaeological precedent, plus its brilliantly elegant coating of base commercialization. It's very interesting because here he brings both ends together, okay, that not only was this uh, a high-end kind of uh, style and practice, but it was also a very commercial one. So it wasn't exclusive in that sense. It was very much in your face and it kind of bridged the gap between the sort of extra luxury segment and uh, people with lesser means, which means it got easily adopted by all. That is one point. And the other point is that you really see in Art Deco the aestheticization of uh, the notion of mobility in its various forms, which is a contradiction in terms because mobility, movement, and all that is seen in the static form of uh, architecture. But one does tend to see that. So uh, coming to the formations of high deco in India, like I said earlier, that we tend to see that in the buildings that were uh, designed for uh, several of the princes, uh, uh, of the various states, the Maharajas, the Nawabs, and so on, uh, during the period between the 20s and uh, the 40s. And uh, some examples of that, I think, are a bit necessary to be seen to see how they, in one sense, mirror the kind of ostentatiousness that we see in buildings such as 
the Chrysler and uh, the Empire State. Uh, let's begin by this uh, very interesting, very stark uh, design of a palace, which is called the New Palace uh, in Morbi in Gujarat, uh, designed by the Bombay firm of Gregson, Batley and King uh, in 1942. And whereas it has these extremely sleek lines, uh, you can also see allusions you know, to the design of ocean liners uh, in the manner in which uh, this building is arrayed. Uh, once one goes inside, you see exactly that kind of lushness uh, in its interior that we saw in, uh, say, the lobby of the Chrysler. So uh, the, the palace, the new palace of Morbi, uh, was, like I said, uh, designed by the firm of Gregson, Batley and King. Uh, it was constructed by another Bombay firm, Chapurji Palanji. And there is a very direct connect between the persons who uh, you know, who patronized this design and the notion of what we saw uh, in the United States. Uh, Rajkumari uh, Rukshmani Devi, uh, daughter of the late Maharaja Mahendra Singhji, for whom this palace was designed, said that it was the dream of a young Maharaja. In his early 20s, my father had traveled to America and he became very interested in art deco. It was the fashion of the time. Uh, well, that's exactly true. It is a very, very fashionable uh, kind of, uh, uh, of, of building and interiors and stylizations. Uh, the interior mur uh, had several murals uh, by the Polish artist Stefan Noblin. You can see some in this image. The furnishings were brought from London's uh, Tottenham Court uh, Road. And if I can just read a little uh, list, Napoleon marble columns, uh, Botticino marble linings and architraves to the doorway, cedar onyx columns with Belgian blue, marble plinths, sliding doors, cellulose in Cheltenham bronze, satin silver, uh, electric ceiling pendants, uh, chairs in Cuban mahogany, pedestrial, pedestals in French walnut, and so on and so on. Uh, you can see uh, the opulence at, at, at probably every level uh, in this uh, design. A slightly different and more interesting uh, building uh, is this one, which was, uh, uh, which was commissioned by another uh, Prince uh, Yashwantrao Volkar in Indore who wanted a uh, house for himself. Uh, in 1930, a young German architect received a commission from the Maharaja to build and to furnish a palace in India. Uh, that uh, architect's name was Eckhart Muthesius, and he was the son of a fa very famous architect called Hermann Muthesius, uh, who was uh, a part of the art schools in Prussia and a well-known writer on architecture. Uh, Yashwantrao Holkar wanted to uh, build and furnish this in the most contemporary and modern of styles. Uh, he, one, one can see the starkness of a, a kind of proto-modern kind of design. You know, there is a bit of uh, leaning towards the Bauhaus kind of minimalism. Uh, and a very functional kind of design, and so on. Uh, so from the outside, you can look at it more as a very modernist piece of work, and from the inside, of course, Art Deco. Uh, one way to, I think, one of the best ways to symbolize uh, the, the, the idea of how much Art Deco was embedded in the sensibilities of the royals is to look at this very, very interesting uh, uh, set of two uh, portraits uh, which were commissioned by the Holkers, where uh, you can see uh, both the Maharaja and uh, the Maharani in a very typically, uh, you know, Art Deco kind of uh, uh, 
setting, which includes furniture and, of course, most importantly, dress. Uh, when I see the painting of uh, Yashwant Rao Holkar over here, my mind is immediately taken to uh, the books of P.G. Woodhouse, you know, and over there, the, the kind of descriptions which you see uh, are almost like how a person would be, uh, you know, in terms of their dress and their behavior and their, their kind of styling. Uh, the interiors of the Manik uh, uh, Bab were uh, again uh, made very much or were commissioned uh, from several famous uh, designers who were in Europe at that time. Uh, they were uh, they were pieces of furniture exclusively commissioned for uh, the uh, the Manik Bab itself. Uh, Customized silverware by Jean Puy Fokrat, uh, uh, a deck chair by Eileen Gray, a floor lamp by Jean Purzel, a chaise lounge by Le Corbusier, screens by Dryan. The French designer uh, Ruhlmann uh, designed the studio, uh, and they had these amazing carpeting and so on. So here, a very modernist, a very contemporary kind of outlook for the interiors. Uh, lush, obviously, but in a very sleek, uh, streamlined kind of way. Uh, and perhaps there is no better example of high art deco in uh, India than probably the most opulent palace of all, the Umed Bhavan in Jodhpur, uh, designed for Mahara. Umed Singh the uh, second, uh, the the I'm sorry, uh, the the architecture of this is a complete integration of, you know, the idea of the palace with the contemporary stylings uh, of the uh, uh, of of Art Deco in its time. Uh, the palace was built with golden yellow sandstone, makrana marble, and Burma teak for the interior woodwork. And when it was complete, had 347 rooms, several courtyards, a very large banquet hall, and so on. And of course, uh, from the inside as well, the kind of glory of the Maharaja is enhanced uh, with the presence of this amazing interior dome. Uh, which looks uh, fairly traditional, but if you look at the detailing, uh, there is a lot of uh, art deco type geometric stylization in it. Uh, but embedded, if you walk around in this place, you, you get a few very interesting sparks of contemporary life. Uh, the Maharaja had a flying club all uh, to himself, and that obsession or that interest is seen in this very beautiful, uh, you know, uh, grill work, jali work, which you can see at different places in this building, which is actually the juxtaposition of several biplanes, uh, which I'm sure the Maharaja flew uh, at that time. Uh, keeping in, uh, uh, keeping with the contemporary kind of uh, luxury kind of expression you have this amazing basement pool uh, under the building, uh, which has a lot of murals which are in the style at that time. And here you can see an example of, you know, just this is one of the corner bathrooms in, uh, the, uh, in, in, in the palace where every part, every aspect of it is completely detailed out uh, this image centers on, you know, an island tub, which uh, one can enter and it has all the other fixtures arrayed all around it. Uh, so you can see the, the way in which the expression of uh, the style of the present uh, was seen in the, these new buildings, which were designed by the, uh, or which were commissioned by the Maharajas of the time. After the, uh, the 
buildings of New Delhi were ready, uh, which were Latians and Baker's buildings. There was also a bit of a rush for a lot of the Maharajas to have their own buildings in Delhi as well. And we can see a couple of them over here. Uh, this is the Kota House in Delhi, designed in 1938 uh, by the Bombay firm of Master Sathe and Bhuta. Uh, this building is uh, now part of the Naval Officers Annex. And the other building is the Dholpur House, uh, former residence of the, of the Rana of Dholpur in Delhi. Uh, and also was constructed probably in the 1930s. So both these buildings too, uh, you know, they express themselves in the contemporary stylings of the day. And they're probably built with the contemporary materials of uh, RCC, which was uh, emerging at that time. Uh, compare these with, you know, just a generation prior when you had the great buildings which were built in the Indo-Sarsenic style you know, uh, by architects like Mant and Chisholm. You see them in Kolhapur and you see them in uh, Itzal Karanji, you see them in Jaipur and so on, which have all those intricate uh, kind of details, uh, mix of Indian and Western uh, kind of things and compare them with this starkness or sleekness or streamlining of the buildings of the uh, 1930s. So coming to the notion of mobility, okay, and we can see that not only through the buildings, but also the other forms of expression, especially the more popular forms as are seen in these two posters over here. Uh, the poster of the steamship Normandy is considered a classic of art deco graphic design uh, by the artist Cassandre. Uh, who, who designed several posters uh, in which, you know, the, the, the scale, the movement, the mobility is all depicted in this extremely stylized manner. Uh, and look at the other one, which is a very beautiful travel poster for Indian tourism, uh, which depicts uh, the, the Golden Temple at Amritsar also with uh, a lot of stylized uh, kind of way, but it looks rich, it is very, very colorful, and so on. So, uh, coming back to Windover, what he says is that Art Deco was a mode of mobility, a style that aesthetized systems of mobility, which underpinned the modern societies that adopted it. Mobility is present on the very surfaces of Deco objects in architecture, in iconography and in general formal qualities, whether the zigzag rectilinear forms or the curvilinear streamlining, the interest in mobility during the years between the wars mirrored the near obsession with speed and movement, both physical and social, popularly held at the time. Uh, we have to expand this notion of movement, not only to the obvious interpretations in terms of transportation, whether it is ocean liners or airplanes or fast cars and so on, but also to the notion of the physical movement of people. Okay, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the people at this time, especially in major cities like Bombay, for example, were migrants. They had come to the city uh, to make their uh, careers, you find this is a time when in a place like Bombay, for example, there is a transformation into a kind of a cosmopolitan uh, society, a relatively well-developed English speaking society, people with education and awareness of what is happening in the world and people coming to the city of Bombay to get their jobs in, you know, uh, in, in very interestingly, you know, not blue collar, but more white collar kind of jobs, uh, especially in the emerging commercial districts uh, of Bombay in the offices, the mercantile kind of offices in the banks, and most importantly, and we will see that when, because it's related to architecture in insurance companies. So again, let's 
continue this idea of mobility because we can see that then even in expressions done here. Uh, here is a very interesting poster for a film uh, in 1936 by Mehboob Khan uh, called Deccan Queen. And if you look at the poster, you can see everything uh, marks the notion of speed, whether it is the fonts used, whether it is the presence of the train, which is in, in turn being, I think, a race between a train and a, a fast car and a race between a fast car and a motorcycle. And of course, a smoking gun, which also indicates the speed by which a bullet emerges. Uh, this is, of course, for consumption by everyone. But on the other hand, you see this other travel poster, which is a very interesting one, because it is uh, a poster for special trains for the races in Pune. And when we, I, I suppose races here uh, means horse races, uh, which meant that there were seasons for these uh, races uh, which took place uh, in, in different parts of the country and especially in Pune, probably people would come from Bombay or other parts uh, of India, especially for that. And the train travel therefore was seen as the train travel for the kind of people who would patronize uh, these kind of uh, uh, upmarket games, so to speak, uh, if that is what one can call uh, the races. So, all these ideas are kind of coming together and one tends to see it in some form or the other in the transformation of, uh, of, of the country, of the urban uh, parts of the country at least uh, during this uh, particular time. And that is from this point, I think we can now turn our attention to what I uh, would like to refer to as the everyday deco. So the everyday deco is a kind of uh, architecture and a kind of expression that is seen everywhere, that is consumed by everybody, that is adaptable at every scale, but it still fashions a lifestyle. It still fulfills aspirations. And one of the ways, of course, is through the new kind of homes uh, that were built uh, during this time. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Art Deco buildings at the Oval Maidan are now iconic expressions of that, as are the buildings uh, on the Marine Drive. I'm just showing you this as one example. This is a photograph of Rusi Court on the Oval, probably taken almost the very year it was built, around 1936, and then hand-colored and has been then printed. And uh, I think you can look at... Uh, several things on this building that you can then keep in mind because you will tend to see them in, in various uh, combinations again and again. Uh, the first is, of course, you know, the brightness of the coloring uh, of these buildings. The other is the fact that it is now using very expressively this new material called RCC, and it can be seen in the form of these wonderful cantilevers, uh, which were not possible uh, with earlier materials. Uh, RCC, of course, gives rise to the one singular uh, characteristic of all Art Deco, uh, however ordinary it might seem, but the flat roof. It also gives rise to the possibility of layering so that you can build typical floors one above the other. Uh, mm. Once these kind of came into effect, uh, they were adopted, of course, very quickly. You could build fast. You could build uh, firmly, you know, uh, buildings that would last for a long time. And then, of course, they all received this overcoat of ornamentation. So you can see the ornamentation on buildings like these uh, through especially the, you know, the highlighted uh, horizontals, uh, the banding, which are called speed lines. Uh, in the case of Rusi Court, right above the entrance, you have this wonderful uh, uh, motif, which is called a frozen fountain, once again, referring to movement and certain curvilinear shapes, which become very, very common. And that overall notion of the, uh, of, of, of the step profile. Very typically, most 
not all, but most art deco buildings have this one singular focus, this singular element which rises above everything else and the other parts of the building are arrayed around it. Uh, please keep these things in mind because these are the things that you will uh, tend to see uh, again and again. And these become one of the ways by which one recognizes uh, art deco when one sees it. Now, I just want to uh, refer back a little bit to the fact that you, know, you have buildings which have this kind of step profile. Now, these step profile emerged actually from an earlier uh, set of, uh, of, of building regulations, uh, very typically in Manhattan, which uh, insisted that as a building rose in height, it should be stepped back and stepped back as it rose in height so that adequate light and would fall on the, on, on the ground between the buildings. Uh, and, and this probably emerged because as buildings started growing taller and taller, they started you know, coming so close to each other in, in, in the middle of a street that you had hardly any light reaching the ground. And so in order to do that, you needed to make the building stepped up in this kind of uh, form. And this form then kind of gets uh, you know, transformed into the step profile, which we tend to see is very, very common with uh, Art Deco buildings. Uh, even when you know, these kind of regulations are not in place, the buildings still tend to take this formation. So in the rising uh, middle classes uh, in, in cities like Bombay, in this rising mercantile uh, uh, city, you tend to see, of course, the presence of new, uh, new office buildings, new workplaces, uh, banks on the one hand, uh, insurance buildings like the Lakshmi building. You had entire precincts which had Art Deco buildings such as the Firosha Mehta Road. And you also had, uh, if this is work, then this is play. You had the, the, uh, the rise of the iconic uh, cinema houses. Uh, the Eros Cinema, the Regal Cinema uh, are just two examples of the many kind of cinema houses. And the cinema houses were probably the places where wish fulfillment, fantasy, aspiration fulfillment was uh, could be indulged in by every uh, manner of, uh, of, of citizenry uh, who came to watch films. And you had obviously the presence of all the top movies from Hollywood competing with the movies that were emerging from the Bombay studios uh, themselves. And of course, housing. Uh, housing, I think, is one of the central uh, uh, places where we see the expressions of Art Deco architecture in many different ways. And this is a very lovely photograph uh, of the buildings on the Oval Medhan, probably very close to the time that they had all come up, which would mean by the more or less the end of the 30s. Uh, what makes uh, Bombay, I think, significant and why we tend to remember Bombay as places uh, you know, of Art Deco is because it's in place like Bombay, thanks to uh, uh, a, a set of historical circumstances, in this case, the Back Bay reclamations, uh, thanks to the 1896 plague, which led to a lot of mini town planning schemes all over the island city, uh, you had plots which were identified, which were demarcated. And on those plots, mostly rectangular plots, these new buildings could come up pretty much like tabula rasa. Okay, so there would then be these newer parts of the city, which looked quite different uh, from the older parts, which were relatively densely packed. Uh, together. These new buildings also had one very important characteristic, and that is that they were not self-effacing. All the facades were meant to be right there in your face, to be looked at, to be admired, to be talked about. And you can notice the manner in which the front of the building is always given a lot of attention and priority. Uh, 
this is also the time when the corner buildings become very, very special, which is basically a building on two roads. So the corner where the building turns becomes the focal point uh, for the expression of ornament and the expression of RCC in, its, uh, in all its glory. The other uh, important precinct is, of course, the Marine Drive precinct. And here, uh, two things come together. The first is, of course, its location on the waterfront. And that is, uh, it, it gives you know, the, the kind of skyline that one would then look at, say, in the case of Miami, you know, where you have a skyline on the waterfront as well. Uh, and in this case, there are several nods to uh, ocean going in the form of the shapes of the buildings, which allude to ocean liners in the form of the balconies. Uh, there are a lot of nautical imagery. Uh, in fact, there is a building called Oceania uh, in, in, in this line. And you have these porthole windows, these kind of you know, uh, tower-like features and so on. Uh, this is one. The other is the fact that because of this planned development, you also found precincts where there was a harmony of, of this kind of architecture. And I think that is what one tends to remember more than anything else. So the precincts which would be formed in different parts of Bombay, the Oval Medan, the Marine Drive, the Dadar Matunga area, even places like Muhammad Ali Road or the business precincts of Hirosha Mehta Road, because you have a large number of these art deco buildings together, they, they form an urban backdrop uh, from the 30s and 40s, which of course remained more or less the same right until the turn of the century uh, that we associate our urban image of Bombay. Uh, this is probably not true for other parts of the country where buildings are, where we look at art deco buildings, but buildings are seen more as singular uh, uh, examples. So uh, I've talked about the, the, the emergence of the middle class and so on, but there are two other aspects which I do believe merit talking about before we go uh, further. The first uh, is the notion of the architect and the architectural practice. Uh, by the 1930s, several architectural practices had already been established in Bombay. Amongst these were the first generation of Indian architects who had for most part graduated from uh, the Sir JJ school. Uh, the school itself had uh, developed a uh, separate department of architecture. And this was headed uh, for a very long time by some of the biggest most prolific architects, practicing architects in the city itself. Uh, two names which are most important, I think. One is Claude Backley of the firm Gregson Backley and King, who headed the school from 1923 to 1943. And that uh, place was then taken by uh, CM Master, uh, who uh, of the firm Master Sate and Bhuta, probably as big, if not bigger, than Gregson Batley and King's firm, uh, who headed the school for another uh, 10 years or so. Uh, this is an image of some of the teachers uh, of the school who were also some of the leading architects of the city, who were also some of the leading members of the Indian Institute of Architects, which had uh, already come up and was uh, very active in the city and later on uh, in the country. Now, these were people who had their firms in Bombay, but had their practices all over the country. Uh, we've already seen examples of uh, Batley's Morbi Palace. We've already seen example of Master Sati Bhutas, Kota House, and so on. The second important aspect of the rise of uh, Art Deco in the uh, in the country was cement. This was a new material which was coming up. The first cement factories came up in the very early part of the 20th century. Uh, they then kind of proliferated 
in various places in the country. They came together as an association, uh, you know, uh, associated cement companies. They also developed their own marketing division. And one of the things they did very interestingly uh, was to put out a, a, a brochure or a book every year called The Modern House in India, uh, which had only photographs, nothing more, only photographs of the buildings which had come up that year. Uh, this is the cover of one such, uh, one, one such uh, 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 issue of the modern house in India. And in these, you had advertisements, but they were advertisements for concrete. You had catchwords and phrases like concrete gives the maximum service for minimum expenditure. Curved or square, it's equally easy for concrete. So you can notice that the, the, the promotion is aimed both at architects as well as the layperson. Okay. And this is how cement uh, started to become popular in all parts of the country. The validation of this point is that in just one issue, uh, the 1936 issue, if you just turned the pages and you looked at the buildings which were, uh, which were uh, exhibited therein, you would find that in that same issue, you had new buildings built in that year from Bombay, Puma, Pune, Ahmedabad, Surat, Morvi, Udaipur, Indore, Hyderabad, Sikandrabad, Tutikorin, Bangalore, Lahore, Patna, Calcutta, Darjeeling, Kalimpong, Assam, New Delhi, Kanpur, Aligarh, Karachi, Madras, Coimbatore, Aleppo, both Hyderabads, uh, amongst others. So this really tells you how far and wide, because of the uh, use of cement, you found this style uh, coming up in, 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 in different parts of, uh, mm -hmm. of the country. And therefore, when we look at Art Deco in India, we have to assert that it is not just Bombay. Uh, I'll give you a brief run through through several examples of Art Deco buildings in places other than Bombay. And we can see based on what I have already told you, how close they are uh, to the buildings that are there in Bombay. Uh, and, and they are fairly random examples. Uh, mainly telling us about their proliferation more than anything else. Uh, and, and they are, again, not the high deco. This is the everyday deco. We see this in buildings, say, in Darya Ganj, in Delhi, or in Chandni Chowk. Uh, one of these most beautiful examples of this is seen in this uh, building at Chandni Chowk in Delhi. You can see uh, the buildings same style of buildings in Jaipur uh, in, in the form of this uh, private home or in this apartment building in Panjim in Goa. Uh, you can see the expressions of what we call streamlined deco, which is a relatively less ornamented building, but has these very significant curves and deep cantilevers uh, in RCC. Uh, this is a very famous building in Hyderabad. Uh, it's also called the ship building probably because of its uh, peculiar shape. And even the ornamentation, if you can just look at the left image, uh, gives us a sense of time because probably this is the kind of uh, stylized ornamentation uh, more in tune with the painting of murals. Uh, and this in, in the late 30s, the early 40s was a certain trend which was happening in at least the School of Art in Bombay, uh, very likely in the other schools uh, in the country as well. And then I told you about surprises, and this is something that uh, came as a surprise to me when I was uh, in Amritsar, mainly, of course, with the intention to go and visit the Golden Temple. And as one walked towards that, suddenly you had this a uh, very beautiful sliver of a building, okay, uh, which is very clearly in a style that we will associate with Art Deco. And it is, uh, it even has a name on it because you can see that 
made into the grill, into the grill work of the building, probably in stucco called El Ram Gopal, El Ram Lal building. And uh, also displays very amazingly this fantastic, nearly two meter deep cantilever, which has extremely thin cross section, uh, kind of thing, you know, where people like us who live in Bombay can never dream of making. Now, this is one would have thought that this is actually a piece of stone, but it isn't. It is actually an RCC because we can see that in other similar buildings, you know, where the chajja has kind of fallen off. Uh, here too, what we are seeing here is almost a complete adoption of the expression of Art Deco by not necessarily architects, but craftsmen, by builders, you know, the people who are actually with their hands putting together a building. Uh, it's not necessary that these are all, you know, very well worked out and designed, but these are patterns, you know, which are picked up and then put into the designs that lead to the creation of buildings, which we can very readily identify as Art Deco. Another such absolutely amazing example is also here, not very far away from the earlier building. Uh, here there is even a date on the building, so we know that it was built in 1948. And it has this fabulous uh, timber work that, that, that goes through all sorts of interesting kind of curved shapes, uh, which then are of course reflected in the RCC as well. Uh, this kind of streamlining, you know, the, the, the curvatures of the balconies and so on are very much in keeping with the times. And even for the persons who lived there, it must have been this amazing expression of aspiration, you know, in a very, very dense area. The, all the buildings here are completely packed together cheek by jowl. And you have this building that jumps out like a little jewel. So it's, it's very special. Now, this is the kind of thing which I would like to assert you will find in almost every city uh, in the country. And this is the kind of surprise you should always be open for when you walk through the relatively older parts, now older compared to the 21st century, I assume, the older parts of the city where, uh, where, where you know, uh, architectural facades like these will come out and jump out at you. Uh, in Bombay, for example, we tend to see during this period of uh, Art Deco, expression, uh, buildings coming up in different uh, typologies. Uh, it's important to, uh, to, to note that you have obviously first and foremost the apartment block, which is a relatively new typology that emerges and develops very well in a city like Bombay. You have the expression of the office building. Now, these two are quite, quite different from each other uh, if you examine them a little bit. Uh, in, in terms of their styling. And uh, then you also have cinema theaters, which form a third type of typology. And of course, private bungalows, uh, which we tend to see. Other than that, you will see things, you will see hotels and schools, you'll see even petrol pumps, which are designed in the, uh, in, in the Art Deco uh, style. Uh, here, for example, are, are two buildings from Madras. One is the insurance. You remember I had talked about insurance buildings being very popular. We'll see even more of them. Uh, this one is the Oriental Life Insurance Building in Madras. Looks just like the buildings in Bombay, don't they? And this one, uh, Lucas Electrical Tractor Service, which is a very modest building, but one which, again, directly associates itself with its own product, which is uh, an, an, uh, an artifact of mobility, the tractors, okay. Cinema theaters also uh, come up all over the country and they all look uh, quite uh, interesting and quite similar to each other in the casino in Madras comes up in 1941. Even after independence, you have this, uh, this, this kind of uh, expression, which doesn't immediately change 
just because India has become a free country. Art Deco was so well developed that it continued uh, in, in, in a kind of after image, even for about a decade after independence. And you see that in Delhi, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, example of the Delight Cinema. Now, I just would like to point out to you, you're looking at the Delight Cinema and earlier you have looked at the Oriental Life Insurance Building. Uh, you see how close they are in their form, right? And here is the point of uh, how to look at uh, all these buildings. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, in his book, Philosophical uh, Investigations, describes how certain types of things may be related to each other by a series of overlapping similarities, where no one feature is common to all. He called these family resemblances. While there is no one single property common to all uh, uh, when referred to a particular en entity, like the faces of the members of a single family, there may be resemblances between various members. So you find a lot of similarities, but no hard boundary distinctions uh, between these kind of similarities that you, know, you can box in something and say, no, this is this, or this is art tech, or this is not. Uh, now, whether in places like Bombay, Madras, Jaipur, uh, as we have seen, and as we will see in other examples, I think art deco, when we look at it, is best read as a series of family resemblances, according to Wittgenstein. Because even as we see buildings that differ in typologies, that differ in stylization, that differ in location, you can still see that they seem to be part of the same uh, overall family. Uh, we've looked at these cinema buildings. I'd like to show you more cinema buildings uh, in, in various parts of the country. Uh, and you can see, again, you, very clear family resemblances here, isn't it? Uh, despite the fact that there is one building in Punjab and the other one in Tamil Nadu. So here too, you have that very central feature and then the flanking wings, uh, amazing, extraordinarily bright colors, a lot of ornamentation, a lot of craft work. You know? The ornament is not necessarily uh, designed to be elusive, but whatever is the expression uh, in that particular location, uh, one tends to see that uh, in, in, in this, uh, so you see diverse expressions, you see local expressions and so on. And the cinema theater is something that is really uh, uh, worth examining further when we look at all the, all the buildings that emerged uh, in the country during this time. Uh, this example, the fool in Patiala, Punjab. Uh, Patiala is again an example of a princely state and there are several other buildings too, which come up at this time. Uh, the Fool, of course, being a very characteristically uh, Art Deco-like uh, example. And then you have these, again, very clear family resemblances between uh, you know, uh, philanthropic gestures by individuals or uh, communities in the public realm in the form of this clock tower uh, one in Delhi, the other in Madras. But again, you can see they are either, you know, cousins, if not uh, twins of each other. So what I have been uh, hopefully able to show you is how various expressions of buildings during this time, during this broad period of time, all over the country at every level of scale, tended to have a kind of family resemblance. They tended to be built in the same uh, style with the same aspiration, and they had the same material palette uh, of RCC, of stucco work uh, uh, to, to express themselves. Uh, let's now you know, expand our ideas perhaps even further than that and talk about, you know, uh, buildings that came up not just in India, but even beyond uh, its, uh, uh, its boundaries. A bit of a cheat here, I will also show you buildings in Pakistan, uh, 
uh, that wouldn't be exactly outside of India because at the time they were built, they were very much uh, part of India. But the reason why I'm trying to get at, uh, what I'm trying to get at is that when we look at, uh, you know, this location, which you can see is centered around the Indian Ocean, and we look at all the port cities, most of the port cities all around, and some, of course, which are not port cities as well, uh, inevitably, you will find examples of uh, family resemblances. So we have our cousins in Art Deco all over uh, edging the, the, the land mass uh, that touches the Indian Ocean. Uh, let's go back to the idea of the insurance buildings, okay? And here too, you see uh, one insurance building in Karachi and another one in uh, Cairo. Uh, what do they do? You see, the insurance buildings had to portray a certain facade, uh, a, a certain presence, a certain solidity to evoke a confidence in the people who would come there and you know, put in their money uh, to kind of take care of themselves in, in difficult times. And therefore the expressions of these buildings are always fairly solid, but very contemporary as well. You know, they show you what is contemporary, but in a, uh, you know, in, in, in a very firm kind of manner. And we tend to see that both in the expression of this uh, building in Karachi, as well as in the uh, mis in the insurance building in Cairo, which is uh, in, in downtown Cairo. Uh, even in places like far away places like Iran, uh, one, one tends to see uh, Art Deco buildings, but the uh, buildings in Iran are even a little earlier, I think, uh, than some of the buildings in uh, Bombay, uh, uh, perhaps because of their proximity to uh, Europe, perhaps because of travel, which was obviously much easier at that time. And you see buildings like this uh, school built in 1936 with the great horizontals, the streamlining uh, RCC, and of course, the office buildings such as the British Oil Company. Uh, in Tehran, uh, some more buildings uh, which you see from the 30s and even earlier uh, also do one very interesting thing. They adopt local features. So if you look at this building of the house on Engelhab Street in Tehran a little closely, you will probably see elements from uh, the Mesopotamian heritage uh, of, uh, of Iran, uh, perhaps the uh, you know, details from Persepolis or uh, details from other such uh, 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 places of historical uh, and archaeological importance uh, in Iran. Uh, coming to Pakistan, which of course, like I said, was uh, very much part of India when all these buildings were built. Once again, one tends to see that even at the most quotidian of levels, the expression of Art Deco is uh, is very very prevalent you have exactly the kind of layout of buildings central tall feature side uh, flanking wings a step profile and imagery which evokes movement imagery which evokes power uh, the the machine age in the form of electricity uh, like this very interesting lightning burst uh, in this building in in Karachi, which you see in the middle, topped with the chevron uh, kind of motifs. Uh, buildings which can turn corners exceedingly beautifully because of the way of the RCC uh, cantilevers and so on, and which uh, dominate corners in a very nice way, rather than veiling, they, 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 they portray what, what I like to call good manners in architecture. Uh, even in places like Lahore and Multan, one tends to see uh, these kind of expressions. Uh, what is one seeing? You know, what 
here or in all these places, you are looking at an architecture that is emerging during the time when people are still under colonial rule. Okay. Uh, very interestingly, we don't really find imperial buildings in the Art Deco style, uh, especially in India. We, we don't tend to see that. But what we do find is that everybody else builds in the Art Deco style. So there is a very, perhaps one would call it uh, a very, uh, you know, subliminal form of resistance that is going on here. Because what is this style? This is a style which one can associate with other port cities in the Indian Ocean, it can associate with uh, uh, cities in Europe, and you can associate it with modern buildings that are emerging in the United States at that time, you know, compared to what would what one would see as imperial buildings uh, in, in India. Uh, this kind of streamlined modernism can be seen everywhere. Okay, even when the ornament is much less subdued, or there is hardly any ornament. Just the way in which the building is shaped uh, evokes uh, the, the, the characteristics, the family resemblances to Art Deco, as can be seen here in this building in downtown Cairo, or in this building in Hong Kong. Uh, one example which again requires an entire uh, lecture by itself is uh, the African uh, city of Asamara, uh, where uh, you have a lot of Italian influence, uh, both politically as well as in the architecture. And this building is one of the great iconic examples of Asamara, uh, the Fiat uh, uh, service station. Uh, a, a, a car service station with its absolutely magnificent cantilevered design and streamlining uh, in, in an African city. And we look at more examples of uh, African cities, which are also displaying buildings like this. And you can see the uh, building to the left is a Vedic temple in Durban. And I would like you to just kind of compare it with uh, Gregson Batley and King's Agyari in Bombay, which are probably, you know, these buildings more or less come up uh, not very far away from each other in terms of chronology. Uh, looking at Durban also, we find uh, a very interesting thing. We, we talked about high and low, and here you tend to see one set of buildings, which are these ground and one uh, story buildings, uh, which uh, one finds in uh, in Durban, in the areas which would be uh, probably dominated more by uh, uh, probably the Indian uh, migrants to Durban, who after they have, you know, made it to a certain level of affluence would build buildings like this in a very clearly segregated kind of uh, country because these are buildings which we can very clearly identify as streamlined deco. But at the other end of the scale, in the same city, you have these buildings coming up as well, which uh, perhaps uh, could be uh, said to be the high deco of Durban, uh, whereas uh, which, which would be exclusively, I, I suppose, exclusively white neighborhoods who had their apartment blocks in buildings like these. And as compared to uh, the more, uh, you know, the other kind of neighborhoods where you had a lot, lot of Indian presence. So uh, one of the researchers of uh, the Art Deco of Durban, uh, Professor Frescura, uh, mentions that this style of architecture had already become popular in Indian cities such as Bombay. So he asks this question that are these buildings referring to the home country. It's a very interesting thought, you know, that Bombay is seen as a role model for the architecture of places like Durban. Or perhaps they were independently rejecting the staid classical styles. And here I would refer to the imperial styles and embracing the pacey modern age of fast cars, 
streamlined ocean liners and all that jazz. Unlike the large Art Deco apartment buildings in the white city, in the Indian part of town, Art Deco was almost exclusively employed in two-story buildings with shops and businesses on the ground floor and living apartments above. Now, this is a model we are all familiar with, aren't we? So Durban becomes a very interesting example uh, of parts of the city which are developed by Indian traders and businessmen uh, in the early uh, 20th century. Perhaps the former indented labors or the Girmitias had now risen in the world, you know, with later business immigrants erecting these new buildings in the 40s and following the same style as what people in the white city areas were doing. Both have, you know, the same expressions, both have family resemblances, even though there is this wide gulf uh, between the two. So let me end then by, you know, uh, choosing one example and then a set of examples that will help to kind of put all these uh, things in place, especially this notion of family resemblances that I'm talking about. Uh, just look at these, uh, uh, look, look, look at this uh, image. I mean, people in Bombay are all familiar with the Metro Cinema in Bombay, uh, designed by Thomas Lamb and Ditchburn uh, in 1938. What you're seeing here is a kind of uh, newspaper advertisement for its opening, you know, gala opening at 10 of India's largest and most luxurious cinema. And uh, fortunately, even after its internal changes becoming a multiplex from a single screen, the Metro Cinema has still retained its exterior, uh, more or less unchanged. And we all remember it uh, because it is an iconic street corner. But the Metro Cinema can also be seen in different parts of the world. You have the Metro Cinema in Calcutta, built in 1934, the Metro Cinema in Johannesburg, built in 1932. There is a Metro Cinema in Cairo, built in 1940. The Metro Cinema in Durban, built in 1937. Three, if you include Bombay, were designed by the same architect. Uh, the whole idea that we talked about, you know, of how widespread something is, can be seen in this uh, single idea of uh, the Metro Cinemas, almost like a franchise, and they were a franchise of the studio Metro Goldwyn Mayer, uh, which were being seen uh, coming up in different parts of uh, cities lining the Indian Ocean. And of course, uh, the, the, the expressions of these buildings are so self-similar, uh, self you know, that one can look at them with amazement, especially when you put them all uh, in, in the same image. So let me end here by just saying that, uh, you know, in the end, I think we have to allow the buildings to speak for themselves. Now in the, uh, the with, with the second decade of the millennium over, these buildings are now between 70 to 90 years old. Most of these buildings are still occupied. They are still being used. They have been modified from time to time, no doubt. Uh, in this process, none of these buildings lapse into a kind of anonymity that gets very easily forgotten, but they keep on insisting uh, that we pay attention to them with their presence on the streets, uh, wherever they are. Uh, they do not stand out as monuments of an architect's ego, as we would see in some modernist examples. Later, instead, they tend to knit the city together. You know, Art Deco buildings tend to knit it into a certain urban uh, oneness, a certain urban uh, fabric uh, where, you know, commerce, residential areas, places of entertainment, other things all kind of come together and uh, they, they, they present themselves to us in a very interesting way. Uh, at the same time, they express the global aspirations, perhaps, of the people who built them and of the people who inhabited them. And to me, at least, 
are excellent examples of a kind of cosmopolitan culture. Uh, I'd like to end here, but not before just making a small mention that at this point in time, one of the best uh, records of these buildings, uh, very interestingly, is being kept on Instagram. There are Instagram accounts all over uh, who, you know, whose whose makers very assiduously, uh, you know, document Art Deco buildings as they see them. Everyone is aware that it is a fragile entity. That almost none of these buildings really have any, uh, uh, you know, any legislation to be preserved. And nevertheless, before they all go. They are all photographed, they are put on Instagram, they are discussed. And several of the images that I have shown you of buildings other than Bombay and in other parts of, uh, of the world have come from these Instagram accounts. And I have to acknowledge uh, each one of them. Uh, and I have to thank them for the amazing resource that they have created. Uh, Deco in Delhi, Art Deco Jaipur, Kerala Art Deco, Art Deco Madras, Art Deco Hyderabad, Art Deco Goa, Calcutta Art Deco, Art Deco Key, which is Karachi, Art Deco Lahore, Art Deco Tehran, Art Deco Hong Kong, amongst many uh, whom I follow and whom I look at, uh, they are the people who are, you know, keeping the awareness going. And I, I think their contribution is invaluable. Uh, in the future, a lot of researchers, I think, will be looking back at the work uh, that uh, these accounts are doing in their own very modest uh, and, and, and quite a humble way, but nevertheless are very important for us uh, to be able to even talk about these uh, buildings uh, that are so ubiquitous, but are fragile enough to you know, get demolished for newer constructions to come in uh, from time to time. So I thank you very much for your attention. And I uh, really appreciate once again, the opportunity to give this talk to you. Uh, thank you, the Museum Society, CSMVS, and the Cambridge Society. Thank you very much. <laughs>